I'm not. I'm not. It is Thursday, and that means that it is time for Freightonomics here at noon. If you're watching live, I'm Zach Strickland, head of market intelligence at Freightways, and with me, as usual, Anthony Smith, chief economist at Freightways. Anthony? Zach, I mean, <laughs> we were talking about this before the show. It's yeah. been an uh, interesting time in the macroeconomy, and Interesting. We, we kind of went through some of this earlier on of the art of storytelling. Yeah. But it, there, a line in the sand has to be drawn at some point in time. Also, I should mention, I'm going to be looking down from time to time. I'm only being a little bit rude, but if you want to join in on today's conversation, we, as Zach said, are streaming live and we are going to be watching the comment section. So if you want to join the show, have some input, questions, anything like that, just want to shout out, join in on the LinkedIn chat as well. Yeah, honesty is... Is, is, is somewhat subjective at times, especially when you're trying to tell the story. And, you know, it's earnings season once again, and we always sit here and we listen to them pontificate about their, you know, what they view as, as, as happening. We talked about it earlier on Freightways Now with Bill uh, about what to make of some of these seemingly optimistic outlooks. And they're always, they always skew towards optimism, and that's not the worst thing. Uh, certainly not criticizing that because you almost have to, Anthony. Yeah. But we are here today to break down where is that line in the sand uh, of optimism versus dishonesty because there is there is a fine line to walk there. You don't want to be too doom and gloom because some of that can actually self manifest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you don't want to like inspire fear, especially when it comes to things like banking. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I mean, uh, the other big thing is it's like. We've, I, I think it's almost a, a mix of, an unhealthy mix of reporting the facts and PR at the same time. And we talk about it all the time with companies and much of the same is almost the same with the Fed. And, and we got to jump into all this, but of course, Zach, you, I, for, I almost forgot, you got to break down the markets. Yeah, and this is straight facts. <laughs> this is straight there facts. There is no... No feelings. Uh, there's no intellectual dishonesty here. Uh, if you want to count me in, we'll get everybody set up with the market in two. In go ahead. three, two, one, go. Yeah, nothing new to see here uh, in the outbound tender volume index as it does recover out of that Easter dip that we normally see. However, Easter really didn't look like it did uh, traditionally. We normally have this noticeable trough uh, in Easter volumes when the OTVI drops about 2 to 3% uh, for a seven-day moving average as it, as it is a moving average. And it, it, it kind of bounced around a little bit, didn't really drop that strong. People just kept operating really as as usual, uh, business as usual in the OTVI. But this little uptick here at the end does appear to be a little bit stronger, but it's about the same as it was in March. So demand really staying flat. Now, let's look to see week over week where some of this demand movement occurred, looking at the OTVI tree in our next uh, chart or visual tool here. The OTVI tree uh, that we have pulled up here, uh, the colors mean that it's increased week over week. So markets that have increased are in green. Not a lot of red on this tree map, but if you look over to the far left, Ontario, the nation's second largest market, or it has been the nation's second largest market for a while, showing a 14.9% increase. And that is off being a huge market. So 15% increase, nothing to sneeze at. Let's look at the Ontario volumes in our next visual to see what's really going on. Now we see that Ontario is down dramatically <laughs> versus last year, even as late as fall of last year, but it is on its way back up. So could we be seeing a renaissance of the Ontario Southern California market, which has been dismal this winter? Uh, tender rejection rates, however, are not really that eventful, uh, still kind of bouncing off the floor. Uh, let's look at the next chart here, see the outlook. So with Ontario coming back online, could this support this forecast, if you look at the spot rate forecast coming from the National Truckload Index here, it's showing that there's going to be an increase coming in the next couple of weeks as we enter May after being very, very down. Amazing. Yeah. Once again. So, Zach, let's talk about that aspect around California. Yeah. What's going on there? Yeah, California is a pivotal uh, freight market. And we're going to hear about it. We've heard about it through the earnings season, the early part of earnings season. J.B. Hunt, of course, blamed California volumes for their intermodal uh, situation. Um, and this loss of import volume over the last 12 months 
You know, really, it started in May, I guess. May to June, we started to see some erosion coming from the bookings and into it then, you know, flushed itself out and through uh, the rest of the, the year. But the Ontario market, of course, and the Los Angeles, Southern California markets are the biggest gateway for volumes. And you can see there in the outbound tender volume index for Ontario, it took a minute for that demand to erode out of Southern California. You know, the rest of the market kind of fell off earlier in the year, but Ontario volumes just stayed relatively high for a period of time. And then once that import volume dried up, so did the volumes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, of course, we saw some shifting of that to the East Coast, but really um, one of the headlines that was read this morning on freight waves now was around uh, the consumer. And I believe uh, one of the executives there in California and one of the ports mentioned that waning consumer demand is also to blame for the lack of goods coming in through California. Yeah, and that's that's accurate. Yeah. <laughs> that is that is fact. Uh, there, there's consumer demand is is waning, but I mean we have to also set you know set the page or set the the table here. The context is consumer demand is falling from all time highs. Mm -hmm. Like during the pandemic, the consumer was overcharged. Yeah. You know, I talk about this all the time. I mean, you you know this. <laughs> we, we, we see it in the data. The macroeconomic data does a good job of painting this picture uh, relatively when you're not looking at do dollar values, I should say. But uh, consumers were incentivized to, they had a, they had a bunch of money. Uh, unemployment benefits were coming in. Stimulus, unemployment benefits. They were sitting at home, didn't have anything to do. Access to the internet. Yeah ordering stuff, redoing their houses, not driving their vehicles. <laughs> Perfect storm of consumption bubble. Yeah. And that's what we're dealing with right now. Would you would you disagree? No, I, I agree with that. And it was essentially, like you said, a bubble. And um, we're still seeing the ramifications of that today. Um, it's been a rocky road getting to that point. Uh, but we also see a split in some of the consumers. So of course, really got the labor market, the jobs that have been lost, a lot of them have been um, higher income roles, white collar roles. We're thinking about the tech sector. Meta just announced more layoffs. I think it was the second half of, of it's going to be happening recently as of t uh, yesterday, I should say. Um, so that's happening. You're seeing the roles that are open, a lot of them around hospitality, um, hotels, restaurants, things like that. So there's a disconnect compared to the roles that are being lost versus the roles that are still open. And then you see spending still happening on travel and experiences and things like that. That's a different type of, I would say, you know, income earner, household income, yeah. compared to, of course, when we see, um, you know, savings rate still at lows that we haven't seen in well over a decade. So the consumer, like the, the strength of them is definitely going to be sitting on those that, of course, have a job. But the job market is definitely showing some cracks when we look at initial jobs claims. And that's not to be looked at as a leading indicator at all because sentiment has shifted. And it's also going to be something that's going to spike suddenly after I think more people kind of get caught up to what some of the macroeconomic environments are showing. But we're seeing that the latest uh, initial jobs claim number popped up well over 240 claims, which is significant. Four-week moving average also increasing, but the overall continuing claims trend is moving upward as well. So showing that a lot of the folks that have filed for unemployment are staying on unemployment, despite what we're seeing in the overall unemployment rate. Yeah, you, you talk about the employment sector as being a pretty noisy thing to monitor macroeconomically, right? And one of those reasons is that it's very lagged. And then, you know, not just in the way that the data moves, but also in the way that companies you know, manage their employee levels. Like right. they almost wait to the last minute to start doing layoffs and things like that, you yeah. know? And just like they wait till they have an uh, overt need before they start hiring again. You know, it's gotta be justified. There's gotta be an ROI. There, uh, you know, there's gotta be, it's a long decision. And we see that in trucking. I mean, it's no different in trucking. This is the capacity side of the trucking environment. Um, and, and before we get into the first earnings report of the season uh, in J.B. Hunt, I wanted to give a quick produce season check. I wrote an article about this uh, in, uh, you know, the chart of the week on FreightWaves.com because produce season, for those of you that don't know, uh, and there's the chart right there, uh, that is where really we call produce season, it's California produce season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of, most of our cash crops, you know, that aren't grain come out of California. You've got tomatoes, strawberries, lettuce, lettuce being a huge one, uh, broccoli, name it, cruciferous vegetables uh, come out of California and the harvest season is very tight. Uh, you've got to go out there, get all this, you know, get all this freight and it's got to hit store shelves. You got to have it 
fresh, and it spoils really fast. So it causes huge disruptions to capacity. Now, this is a chart, it's a spaghetti chart of uh, the rate. It's a mix of rates, uh, produce rates furnished by the USDA, and t reefer tender rejection rates, refrigerated capacity rejection rates, uh, as uh, you know, we monitor here for California markets. And you can see, before I wrote my article, there was nothing. <laughs> there was nothing going on. But if you look really closely towards the end, you've got a purple line and an orange line spike. The purple line is refrigerated rejection rates for the Los Angeles market. So tender rejection rates for contract freight uh, coming out of Los Angeles, Southern California, uh, spiking here, 3.1%. Uh, not unusual uh, by any means, but it's certainly worth noting that at the same time, Los Angeles to Dallas produce rates are also showing an upturn in, in overall price. Not hitting all-time highs or anything like that. They were actually higher uh, earlier in the year, but it is something to monitor because Southern California does have the Imperial Valley down there in the Salton Sea. It's a big farming agricultural space. That has been relatively active. So maybe we are seeing the early signs of produce season. Yeah, and, and Zach, when we're looking at produce season, we're going to be some of the headwinds, of course. We saw some of the weather in California over the last few months with flooding. I mean, are you anticipating that to definitely kind of hamper some of the oh. overall produce output? Yeah, and it's hard to tell what it's going to do yeah. because the rains delay the harvest or delay the planting, which delays the harvest, right. and then it impacts the yield of the harvest. So it does two things. <laughs> there may not be as much lettuce. Yeah, <laughs> It's also going to come on very inconsistently, which means that these truckers are going to have to go out there on a moment's notice. It's going to be very uneven in demand, so they could show up, there'd be nothing there. They could show up, there'd be too much there. Right. So a lot of volatility potential there, but also could be a lot of nothing. <laughs> yeah, could be a lot of nothing. Yeah. Also, uh, we mentioned it earlier on in the show, I'm going to jump off course into the Newsonomics segment. J.B. Hunt mentioned it. Yeah. They said it. They said the recession word, freight recession, freight recession, and that we're seeing some of the impacts from it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, they're one of the ones that mentioned California demand, you know, as regards to container demand, uh, really falling off a cliff out there over the last year, and it's had a huge impact to intermodal. So looking at their overall figures, they're really the company itself still doing just fine. Uh, 88 OR, or no, I'm sorry, it's not an 88. Uh, intermodal OR is 89, and they were complaining about that. The truckload OR suffered the most, went from an 87 to a 97. That's significant. And this is arguably one of the smallest segments of what they do. Uh, JB Hunt's considered a, truck, a trucking company, and they are, uh, for sure, but intermodal and dedicated trucking. Very different business models on that regard. But uh, as far as intermodal goes, less uh, 15 to 20% uh, available capacity. Uh, but I wanna kind of highlight uh, the brokerage section here because this is what, you know, a lot of people are interested in the brokerage segment. This is gonna be the numbers uh, reported by Todd Maiden here. And Shelly Simpson says, spot market appears to be leveling out as many carriers are already operating at a loss and can't absorb further declines in spot rates. Um, and, you know, this feels hopeful. <laughs> I don't know that there's any data that supports too much of it, but I think she's right in the way that spot rates have slowed mm -hmm. a little bit. And our forecast, like I showed you, shows that there's a bouncing potential yes. coming. But I don't know that they've leveled <laughs> just yet. I think it's still a little early to call. That optimism, I'm going to say, hold up. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, And their data may support that. But looking at their Q1 versus uh, Q1 numbers, the brokerage sector is just dramatically down. Yeah. This is significant. 42% drop in revenue. <laughs> That's huge. Also, I, I want to highlight um, one of the things there is that you mentioned there was some optimism being shown there. Yeah. And, and I think even if, like, you know, we don't quite see it just yet, there's basis for that. And I think that's the important thing when we're looking at some of these quarterly numbers is reading between those lines and really cutting through it because a lot of them are going to try to position this as like, hey, you know what, we're coming off of all-time highs, but we're still seeing that there's some opportunities out there or 
we're expecting robust growth. Like that's when you start to hear those kind of things. You really got to start questioning it. But when you hear these opportunities of like, okay, I can see where they're coming from from their perspective. That's where I can kind of get around where some of the people come from, from their optimism, whether I agree with it or not. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's based in fact, for yeah. sure. I mean, it's hard to imagine spot rates falling much further. And I think arguably you can say that because basically you're getting to the point where operators now have to pick going out of business and just say, I'm done. <laughs> this, this outlook does not look, I cannot sustain through the rest of the year. Uh, and just barely making it by at a loss yeah. for a period of time. And that's that's where we're at. So yes, I think I think it's warranted optimism, if you can call it optimism. <laughs> uh, but overall brokerage is suffering across the country. This is not a this is not a good business model for this environment right now. However, there is a little bit of positivity in this and the way that their margins did expand. <laughs> yeah. And this yeah. makes sense because carriers are going to bid their rates lower and if you can maintain, uh, you know, some of that stability in the rate, mm. you can get that down. However, that is just not going to be a sustainable model moving forward. Not at all. And speaking of uh, sustainable, moving into the next story, Martin, um, that drove more in the first quarter, but they ended up making less yeah. money on that. Yeah, and there's some, there's a lot of congruency here between Martin and J.B. Hunt, especially on the intermodal side. Uh, intermodal OR jumped 84 to 90%. Um, their overall OR went from an 83 to a 90. Uh, mileage up 8%. Wow. But that's on a tractor count being up at 9%. <laughs> so they grew their fleet size 9% and they drove 8% more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the mileage can be a little deceiving. Also, their empty revenue miles, their non-revenue miles were up about two percentage points or 200 basis points uh, over the course of the uh, the quarter or the year here. Um, so, you know, the, I think that another big takeaway here, because J.B. Hunt also increased their fleet, uh, their tractors, 33% increase in tractors uh, could be leased on. And I think this is a trend to watch for these larger carriers. Yeah. They grow their fleets, but they're not necessarily growing them with absolute like purchases. You get these leased on operators now, these owner ops that are like, I can't sustain my business. They move in. This consolidation is really what we're talking about when we're saying capacity reduction at this point, um, because a lot of these these trucks get gobbled up. Yeah, these drivers don't just like go off into the sunset. <laughs> you know, they need to work. The economy's not doing great. And it's hard to transition into other jobs. And one of our next uh, earnings, we're going to talk about construction with Prologis, but they can't just jump into, you know, construction out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a long process. And yeah. right now we're seeing some consolidation. Yeah. And, and speaking on the Prologis side, I mean, it seems like they have some optimism with the tightness in the warehousing space, even though... Um, what we're seeing in the macro economy, they're seeing some opportunity looking forward. Yeah, and I think this optimism is warranted. Um, I don't, I don't think it's great news for the long, long term. <laughs> uh, but they cite Prologis, of course, showing a pretty strong Q1 or uh, 23 over 22 uh, improvement here. Uh, they actually improved their occupancy rate uh, by about 60 basis points. Um, their rent. Uh, Basically, they're able to get a lot more money yeah. <laughs> uh, for the same space over the period of rent. So their rent increased significantly. We've talked about this with Dr. Zach Rogers in the past, how pricing for warehousing has not deflated at all. It's still inflationary. Um, and I think they do have some tailwinds here in terms of, well, if you can't sell your inventory as a uh, you know retailer, you're going to need space to hold it because you can't get rid of it. Right. Then you need still you still need more goods on top of that because you the seasonal freight stays. Yeah, it's like I don't know how much is there. And JB Hunt, a little connection between these two. JB Hunt did mention that they they have never seen uh, a more at this point our customers have been less accurate than ever before uh, regarding their forecasted demand in terms of how much they were gonna need transportation. Uh, Darren Field, president of Intermodal, said that. So this is a tailwind for warehousing because they can't move the goods and it sits there. You know, if you're not gonna liquidate it, 
uh, then it's going to be there. And then the second part of this equation, which is more in your uh, department here, uh, they said that the construction sector fallen off a cliff because the banking environment and investment environment has just tanked. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a big one. And I think um, there was a significant amount of investment into non-residential um, construction. We even see some of the lacking construction uh, spending data from February showing that there's been increase in manufacturing. Um, of course, new orders, backlogs roll in, but I think, like I said, it's, it's lagging there. Um, and the other big thing we're thinking about warehousing space and warehousing prices, um, prices specifically, again, quoting uh, somewhat from Zach Rogers, Dr. Zach Rogers, uh, it was one of the points he made is like, it's a very sticky thing. So like you have to see a substantial drop and a sustained drop in order for that pricing to make its way into some of those other components. And so um, it's not enough to just see, okay, we have one quarter, two quarters down. You have to see something very, you know, sustained and very substantial in order to kind of have that reflected. Yeah. Um, and then one more article that I want to I want to get to here. And Adam Josephson, uh, a new contributor here to Freight Waves, uh, comes to us from Key Bank, and where he worked with the packaging and CPG sector. Um, really good articles. Uh, just check them out on FreightWaves.com. But one of the articles about Costco's March sales highlight consumer shift to essentials. And this Costco chart that he has in there really paints a pretty decent picture. Uh, there you go. Basically, Costco comparable sales, excluding changes in gasoline prices, um, it's just dropping. Like it's it's falling off a cliff. So uh, what, do, what do you make of this when we're talking about in the context of consumer situation? I mean, Costco, obviously a huge uh, where, you know, consumer warehouse, <laughs> if yeah. you will. I think um, it definitely makes sense when you're looking at even um, higher income earners starting to, I wouldn't say trade down, but shopping more so for that value mm -hmm. as opposed to, hey, I'm just going to go stop at whether it be a Whole Foods or something like that. Maybe they're going to buy in bulk and they're making those uh, kinds of decisions. So we're still seeing that um, even though the CPI came down, those core components were still very much elevated at, at the same time. And so we're looking at some of the costs around food and apparel and stuff right. like that, those are still very much present. And so consumers that aren't, say, in the upper middle class range or, uh, or above aren't going to be able to, uh, I don't think, you know, sustain, of course, activity that they had throughout uh, 2021, 20, 22, and going into 23 here. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, to me, this is kind of like, I mean, you, you made a good point. We've got the higher income earners and the lower income earners. And this is, of course, it's, it's speaking on that lower end yeah. uh, to a little uh, bit, but that represents the majority, right? not? <laughs> right. I mean, this is where goods demand comes from. Exactly. And I think it kind of comes down to, as well as uh, not just consumer conditions, but the, 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 the storyline being kind of put for those consumers, because of course, um, when we think about, uh, you know, a lot of industry outlooks for in 2022, people have been talking about recession for quite some time. And like you said earlier on the show, it can be almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. But um, when we're looking at what, you know, the storyline that's kind of being told, we're looking at, so for example, um, the, the, the storyline kind of goes, hey, there's not going to be an inflation. Now there's inflation. Hey, don't <laughs> worry. You're talking about the Fed, The right? Fed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, it's going to be transitory. Then it wasn't transitory. Oh, don't worry. And, and this is where the dishonesty comes into play. Like the storyline is only good as your your reputation. I can and if your imagine. reputation, and if you're making bad calls yeah. all the time, you're you're now have lost. You know all of the uh, you know the value in your opinion and your yeah. forecasting ability. And that's I think where we're sitting with a lot of these you know, outlooks right. is how accurate are you and what's your motivation? Because everybody is worried about that. I don't want to inspire things getting worse. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the really big point around um, Jay Powell's last talk around, hey, I, you know, and yelling around, hey, our financials are strong. There is no financial crisis, on, uh, you know, in the horizon, anything like that, because of their potential reaction to it. And so there's that, whereas I think some of that dishonesty kind of comes through because yeah. of that fear of what are going to be the repercussions or the reaction to it. And I can only imagine if, I made the call here on FreightWaves Airwaves saying that there wasn't going to be inflation, that it's going to be transitory, that there's nothing to worry about. Like all these calls, 
I would expect a call from Craig at some point in time. <laughs> and, and at the very least saying, hey, stop, stop making any calls here. Yeah, because the accountability. The accountability. accountability. And it's a responsibility to, you know, clients, the people, things like that. We're looking at all this stuff happening and really how to set the storyline. And speaking of Craig, we do have a little bit of a show coming up here. Yes. <laughs> the State of Freight, uh, I will be hosting it uh, coming up here shortly in the next, uh, I guess you're in an hour and a half or so. Uh, Craig Fuller and Adam Josephson, the person that I uh, referenced there for the Costco article and CPG fame, uh, they're gonna, we're going to have a discussion about the State of Freight and other macroeconomic trends as well, Anthony. Looking forward to that one. And of course, if I've missed any of the previous data freights, I can go over into freightways.com, get caught up and watch the previous ones as well. It's always a great time when these three get together because it's just knowledge and gem. <laughs> kind of like a clumsy king just dropping gems all over the place. Just... Gems all over the place. And look for some, you know, we, we, we don't have to be as optimistic. Uh, you know, we use the data. 